Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today we're going to learn about the new for 2020 Fender Limited Edition HM Strat. So this is actually a blast from the past reissue model that they're doing this year, because the original HM Heavy Metal Stratocaster was done in the late 80s to the early 90s. And that was a model that pretty much failed because it was just released too late. The hair metal days were over, grunge was taken over, things like that. So releasing a Fender version of a Super Strat, yeah, didn't go over so well in the late 80s. That just seems to be how Gibson and Fender were back in that era. They were just too late to the party when it came to stereotypical 80s guitars. But over the years, these things have created quite a cult following that you'll find online, that people that just love these guitars, they wish they would have never sold their original ones. So it's a lot like when Gibson reissued the Paul for me, because it was just a beautiful guitar that I loved that was undersung. So now the Fender HM Strat guys, they're happy that a reissue does exist. And essentially the claim to fame for these guys is they are a shredder type guitar offered by Fender. They have a really flat 17 inch radius on these guys. I mean, normally a Fender will have anywhere between the vintage seven and a quarter style radius to a modern like nine and a half. But even the compound radiuses that start at nine and a half, they only go to a flat 14. So 17 across the board, yeah, that's flat. They also have 24 frets, which is kind of an anomaly for a Fender guitar. Usually they stop at 20 to 21. Some of them have 22, but 24. Yeah, that's not something you see all the time. And on top of that, kind of similar to the Fender Ultra series, these things have some additional contours back here. Not only do you have the neck heel sculpting, you also have a slight little swoosh right here, as well as right there, likely for aesthetic choices on that one. But the other one is so it kind of gets out of your way, so you can easily get to all these frets. A few other things that made these things interesting originally were the 25.1 inch scale length. It's kind of in between Gibson and Fender, being normally a 25 and a half, Gibson 24 and three quarters. It's probably most resembling a PRS at this point at 25, but it was just something that they did for these guys to make them a little bit different. And the last feature that we're gonna talk about here is the knobs that they use. They're kind of an interesting, really tall F stamped knob at the top. They've got these little rubber grippers. They're supposed to be great for volume swells and things like that. I mean, this is definitely laid out very well. They also had coil splitting options. And if you came to this video hoping for a really impressive demo of a shred style guitar, sorry, that's not my forte. Check out the official Fender video. They brought in Ethan who did a great job at demonstrating one of these and rumor has it he's the one that's responsible for these things eventually being reissued anyways. Some other famous users of these guys were Greg Howe. He was in the original advertisements of these. It might be a little bit hard to visualize it, but this is just a Stratocaster without a pick guard and a Floyd Rose type system on it. But it has a modified layout. You no longer have the output jack on the front. It's on the side. That's one of my favorite features about these guys. But the bodies just look so radically different because you're so used to seeing this on like an Ibanez style guitar. But once you move up to the headstock, that's when you can see, yep, that's definitely Fender. It just has a black finish over top of it, kind of like a matching headstock type thing. No skunk stripe on these guys, but it's still a maple neck. But here you can see all the regular comfort carves are also here on the HM Stratocaster, just like an original Strat. But again, you have those additional comfort carves right here. Now that we understand what made the HM Strat different from a regular Stratocaster and its place in history, let's go ahead and compare this one to an original... Oh, no. Oh, dang it. I cracked it. I broke a brand new guitar. Oh, the neck got snapped. Oh, Just kidding, it's my glary. <laughs> Let's compare the original to the reissue. What they got right is all the body woods. This is a basswood body. It has a maple neck and your choice between a rosewood and a maple fretboard. Finishes that you can choose from on the reissues include this one, the flash white, a frozen yellow, ice blue, and flash pink. You can find a few other colors on the originals, but, but I mean, Fender's doing this as a limited edition run. They couldn't reissue everything. They just chose the most 80s colors. 
but they got the black headstock with matching color stripe underneath the Strat logo. Stock Goto tuners, and they did reissue those special knobs on these guys. But where they differ is where they were made. So the original run was made in both USA as well as some Japanese made ones. Now there's a little bit of controversy behind the USA made ones being made of Japanese parts or some of the parts were from Japan. We're not gonna get too much into that on this episode, but the reissues are strictly made in Japan and they have an HSS style pickup configuration. Whereas the originals, they had single coil pickups, but they had Super 3 if it was a USA made one or a Super Distortion in the bridge if it was a Japanese made one. Some people might look down upon that. They probably would have preferred to see the Seymour Duncan in here. But honestly, if they just made everything the same, it would make no sense to buy the reissue because it would just be a new version of the old guitar. This is more so paying a tribute to the original. And just as a fun fact, some of the original ones are actually an HH setup. So two humbuckers, some of them are just a single humbucker. Less versatile, but kind of cool. And heck, there's also one called the Ultra HM that had lace sensor pickups and a bunch of other freaky stuff going on. Maybe we'll see one of those if these guys sell well. There were also cheaper Squire versions of them made, as well as other body styles like the Telecaster and even a bass. And now we get into the more controversial side of things. So these new reissues have kind of been stripped down of some important parts. First off, the tone pots do not have the TBX tone control system. We had talked about one of those in my Ultra Strat video not too long ago. Basically, TBX stands for treble bass expander. So the knob would actually notch at five and zero to five would just be your regular tone position, but anything past that, it kind of gives you a boost in your tone. So the fact that the reissues don't have that, I'm, I'm kind of confused about that because I guess that was a big thing with the originals that people did like. And it's just a stacked pot, so I can't imagine it would cost that much more to wire it in. But the biggest thing that Fender's catching flack on about this model is the originals had something that looked like a Floyd Rose. A lot of people will see it and go, oh yeah, that's a Floyd Rose, and then they get told no. It was actually a Kaler 2720 Spider Trem. Now apparently they don't make those anymore, but it was basically a high-end Floyd Rose knockoff. It was like the closest thing you could get to a Floyd Rose without buying the Floyd Rose. But these guys, they actually now have the official Floyd Rose within it, but they gave it the cheapest Floyd Rose ever. This is called the Floyd Rose Special. This is a spec that I would have never caught if it wasn't for other people on the internet. But I looked up the price of these to a retail consumer. They're $84 to buy brand new. So that means manufacturing cost, I would assume it'd be somewhere like half that. So it probably costs them about 40 to 50 bucks for each unit. And whereas they could have put a higher end Floyd Rose in here. Those cost anywhere between 200 to 300 at retail. So when these guys are retailing at $1,199, it feels like this should have had a better Floyd in it. But the reason why this one's kind of a little bit more expensive is yes, it's made in Japan, so you're gonna have very good craftsmanship here, but it is a limited edition. Some dealers have written in their listing that they're only making 300 of each color. I called up Fender to see if they could confirm or deny that. They didn't have an exact number that they were gonna build, but they were able to tell me that they made 226 white and 227 blue. They're still planning to make more, but they can't make any less than that. And that's the only two colors that they had numbers on. Pretty much fair game that these are going to become collectible in the future. But when you can buy an original one used on reverb for anywhere between 700 to 900 bucks, it doesn't really make sense to buy the reissue unless you're just a diehard fan of the originals or you just prefer brand new guitars. So I think it's cool that Fender brought these things back. So I'm not knocking them based on that. So now that we know the differences between this and the original model, let's go ahead and grab my first impressions as a non-shredder guy. First off, I'm sorry. <laughs> this flash white color, I just can't get over it. It looks too much like my Glary. It feels too much like my Glary. I mean, the bodies, they're made of the same stuff. The fretboard made of similar materials. This is likely higher grade. But the necks, the necks even look very similar because they're both maple. They both have that satin finish. This one feels slightly glossier as compared to the Glary but this one's a lot thinner of a neck as compared to over here. But it, it, it's just way too similar. It freaks me out when I switch between these two. Well, that's just based on looks. Once you plug these things in and start playing them, of course the Fender is a million times better than that other guitar. 
But I just can't help think if I shaved that glary neck down and repaired it, if in a blind test, I probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference just based on feel if the necks were the same. Because this thing has that super, super thin neck. I'm actually really digging that. And the frets are massive. They are jumbos and super wide. So I could definitely see how somebody could do some soloing on this guitar. And the whole black and white aesthetic, while it's not my first choice, it's kind of cool. It's got this like serial killer vibe to it. It's like a guitar that I imagine one of those blood splatter paint jobs on. Definitely not the kind of guitar that I normally go for. But the last thing I really want to talk about here lies on the headstock. This was the very first thing I noticed. The Strat logo right here is actually semi-wet metallic. So when you catch it in the light just right, take a look at where that squiggle is. I just love how that changes colors. It's just a very small feature of this guitar that really made it stand out. As far as setup from the factory, um, I'm pretty happy with it. The action's really low, but I didn't really notice any quality control issues, no neck pocket cracks or anything like that. So I, I think you can comfortably order one of these guys online because they're probably gonna sell out pretty quickly. So to learn a little bit more about the HM Strat, let's go ahead, throw it on the workbench and take a look at its individual parts and specs. Now something I found kind of interesting here, the bridge pickup cavity does not actually have any shielding paint within it, but the single coils do. Now I know the single coils are definitely a lot more likely to pick up some noise from other things, and creating the whole Faraday cage for them is a little bit more important than the humbucker, because the humbucker has this little metal plate that kind of acts for that as well. But it just seems weird to do it for two cavities and just not do it for the bridge pickup, because you, why not? You're already doing the painting, that's just something funny I found. But the pickups themselves, they're just called the HM Strat Humbucker and the HM Strat Single Coils. I do not see any type of identification marks on these guys, unfortunately. So as far as uh, being able to tell this between a Glary instrument or even a Gibson pickup, I mean, looking at this, that's very similar to how Gibson does their style. They have the brass screws right there. So I think it would have been nice if they would have marked them with something just, you know, in case one of these things falls out in the wild somewhere. But that's the same thing with the single coils here. They just use two springs to mount into place. And the humbucker uses the humbucker ring, which is plastic. Sometimes on Ibanez style guitars, you'll find like a metal one. But as far as the routes go, they're pretty good, and we can actually see a piece of the basswood body right there. But these are advertised as hot pickups. The bridge position is a 13.5k ohms. These two guys are read about 4.8. Just the middle, you got 7.33. These two guys, 375, and just the neck itself, 7.44. The only other option you have is a coil split on this bridge pickup to make it more of a single coil sound, which would then get you a 6.85. And then you can also do these two in the single mode at 3.57. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven different tonal opportunities. And I've got to say, I love the fact that the output jack is on the side. But here's our Floyd Rose. It is a Floyd Rose double locking special. So I, I believe what that means is it locks down right here so your strings are in place. And then up here, you have the locking nut. Essentially how the Floyd Rose system works is you tune that up to pitch, then you lock them down by using all the included Allen keys. It looks like you get three different sizes. I'm not sure what this bigger one's for. I guess it might be... No, nope, nope, it's not for that. I don't know what that one's for, but you definitely will be using these two. So once those are locked down, these no longer affect the tuning. That's just for the initial part of it. Well, that helps everything be locked in place so you can do crazy tremolo stuff, dive bombs and all that. And if you need to make tweaks, you have to use these little fine tuners at the bottom. Which whenever you have string pressure off, you definitely want to take the time to reset them to a normal position. Because then you have more options to raise or lower the pitch depending on what you need. Now I do notice that these are very hard to move. Especially when you're trying to tighten them down a lot, it like gets completely frozen. But keep in mind, I don't use Floyd Roses like ever, so this is kind of a foreign experience for me. As far as the controls go, this is a master volume for all three pickups. This is a tone for your neck and middle, so all the tones of the single coils. And then this one is a tone for just the bridge pickup. Now you're probably wondering, hey, what happened to our knob here? I wanted to pull it off to get a closer look at it. So here's a nice up close look at this guy. It's a super tall knob. It's got these nice little numbers that are actually raised on the outside of it. The top of it has the F fender logo to it. And you've got this little rubber gripper along the edges of it. It feels pretty nice to use. But let me tell you, these things are a real pain in the butt to take off. It was to the point where I thought maybe there was a screw somewhere securing it to the shaft. 
But no, it eventually came off just with my knob puller. Then this guy, once again, just your mini toggle switch for your coil split. And it is a five-way blade selector switch. Moving on here, uh, none of my radius gauges go to 17, but here's a 16 to show you that we are very close to that 17 mark. So it's a super flat feeling fretboard and combining that with that super thin neck, it's a shredder guitar's dream. But here's a good look at those really tall jumbo frets and there's 24 of them, a full two octave neck here. And you've got the dot markers along the side to help you. But the fretboard material itself is called rosewood and honestly this thing is in pretty good shape straight from the factory i didn't feel the need to have to condition it or anything so we're all good there original locking nut system and then you have this string tree up here just to keep the pressure down and your truss rod now it all makes sense do you use the big one for the truss rod yep okay and once again, your slightly metallic Strat logo here. You can see how it changes colors in the light. And then it just says, buy Fender at the top of the headstock. I don't, I'm not quite sure why they did buy Fender if it's actually a Fender product. Because that makes me feel like it's a Squire by Fender. And we've definitely got that 25.1 inch scale length. And as far as the rest of the neck specs, 1.68 inches at the nut. And by the 12th, I mean, it's a fairly flat, fat feeling neck. So 2.07 here with what they call a slim C neck. So it's about a 0.81 at the first fret and that stays pretty darn consistent, 0.85 by the 12th. And moving on to the back side, here's what we got. The back control plate has a little sticker that tells you it's cancer and reproductive hazardous. I don't know, something about that sticker makes me think the 80s as well. <laughs> But it looks like you have alpha branded pots in here, so nothing too crazy. Full size pots. You can see the style of switch they use there, as well as the mini toggle and the output jack right there. There's another small spot where you can see the basswood body exposed, and here's the back side of the Floyd Rose Special. The back plate here does not have any shielding or anything, and it just has a V on it. And so does this one. I wonder what V stands for. But interestingly enough, there's a small section of that protective film missing over this one. Not a big deal, most people just take it off anyways. Let's just take a minute to look at the comfort contours again, kind of the regular Stratocaster one here. But what I find interesting about these little swoops right here, this one helps you get higher up in the frets, but this one I think it's more so just for aesthetic purposes. But you can see those kind of like mimic the Ibanez style of things as far as where the extra cutaway could have been. So I think the uh, the Ibanez style guitars, they probably have their their own thing going on as far as how they look, play, and feel. But this one's just more so traditional Fender. And the neck plate here, JFFK19, all zeros 158. So I wonder if that means this is the 158th one made. Because that seems like a rather low production number for a 2019 year guitar. I'll have to take a look at some other photos of these to see if they're all relatively low like that. But you do have your micro tilt adjustment in here. It's still a four bolt on neck. But again, you've got the comfort feature right there. And this is just a satin urethane finished maple neck. It's nothing too fancy. You've got some nice wood grain, but that's about it. There's nothing much to say about this besides it being super slim. And up here you have your Godo branded tuners. And your strap buttons are just black and the large style. They're not shawlers or anything like that. Fully assembled, this guitar weighs 7 pounds, 10.9 ounces. So let's go ahead, plug it in, and get a few tone samples out of this guitar. Tone samples that you wouldn't necessarily always hear out of it.
that we know everything about this guitar, what are my final thoughts on this thing? As far as the pros go, I love this neck pickup. It's really hot and juicy. When you have a little bit of distortion on it, it just has that really sweet sound. So I'm digging that, and I really like the fat humbucker in the bridge. The other positions, eh, I mean, they were okay. They just weren't my favorite. Those were definitely the two that stood out to me. It was nice to have the coil split option, but it's not something that I would be using all the time. For lead playing, I can definitely see this super thin neck being a big asset to those players. But most importantly, above all else, I just want to thank Fender for bringing these things back. I love quirky models, and this is kind of one of those, even though Fender is not my strongest point. I'm more of a Gibson guy myself. But it's just cool to see these oddball models get the time of day here in 2020. So good on you guys, Fender, for bringing them back. Now the cons. The, the Floyd Rose. I don't know what I'm doing. I tried to watch some videos. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was out of tune pretty much the entire demo. I tried my best. We, we got it close, but, you know, doing all the dive bomb stuff. It seems to do the job. So I think once you get it tuned up and set up properly, I don't think you're really gonna have too many issues with that because it does hold tune within the tuning that you're supposed to be in. But this is just not my guitar, and it's not just because of the Floyd Rose, it's just so crammed. The way I play guitar, I kind of have a free floating hand. I just like having a lot of movement. It's not the most efficient way to play, it's just the way I do. But I, I find where I normally rest my hand is on the bridge, and you, you don't want to do that with a Floyd Rose. And then you start hitting your knobs. This is very a claustrophobic feel, in my opinion. You kind of got to start picking over the neck to get away from all that. But the people that are playing these, they're more of the fast shredders. So they're gonna have less movement and that's not gonna matter as much. So it's kind of a, a love it or leave it with this whole layout. But overall, this just doesn't feel like a $1,200 guitar. But I understand why it is priced where it is because it's made in Japan and it's a limited edition thing. It's just meant to be, you know, sell a few of them really quickly to the collectors and the people that like them in the niche market. It's not meant to be something that's for sale every day at this price. So thank you Fender for bringing it back. Not the guitar for me, but I'm sure somebody out there will enjoy having these reissued HM Stratocasters because I see these being collectible in the future because it was very low production numbers and you get a bunch of different cool finishes to choose from. The reason why I say it just doesn't feel like a $1,200 guitar is, I mean, there's just nothing too fancy going on here. If it had a higher end Floyd Rose, then maybe I could see some things there. But it just seems to be, you know, pretty basic pickups, pretty basic electronics. It all just comes down to the limited edition status of these guys. So everything makes sense. One kind of cool thing about having the white finish though with the black light test here is you get to see it glow a little bit. I don't see anything too crazy going on with this guitar. It's just mainly for fun looking at it under black light. Just in case you're new to the channel, this is not normally how my videos go, but we do this test to check for breaks, cracks, and repairs. If you purchase one of these brand new, you do get a padded Fender gig bag. I wish they would have done something special with these. I would have preferred a hard shell case at this price point, but if they're doing the gig bag, maybe do like a leopard print or something in here just to match the whole 80s vibe of the guitar. But it's just your basic Fender gig bag here. You got a zippered pouch here, one in the center, as well as one in here. And I did not see any like Fender manual or anything that comes with these guys. No COAs or anything, which I think would have been a nice touch seeing as it's a limited edition. You just get your Floyd Rose wrenches right here. But this gig bag's nothing to really sneeze at. I mean, that is actually a pretty thick padding on this. It's not a basic gig bag by any means. Thank you, Troglodytes, for tuning in to this episode of the Troglase Guitar Show for the HM Stratocaster. This one's already been spoken for through my new Guitar Day program, but I guess if you're looking, I could probably help you find another one. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.